After more than a year of nationwide protests and violence, India's Prime Minister has withdrawn a set of controversial farming laws. But why now and what are the political and economic implications? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahlbara. For more than a year now, farmers across India have been holding mass protests, strikes and sit-ins. Their actions have been against a set of farm laws they say hurt their livelihood. But the government had long defended the legislation which would have ended minimum price guarantees for produce. That was until Friday when Prime Minister Narendra Modi made a sudden announcement his administration will withdraw the controversial laws. We have a lot to get to with our guest. First, Pavni Mittal has the latest from New Delhi. Harjinder Kaur is finally relieved. She's volunteering at a community kitchen in the outskirts of New Delhi, where she has been protesting with thousands of other farmers. She says it's been a difficult year for her. It was hot, but they turned off our water supply, electricity and roads to come and go. They did everything they could to make our life difficult, but we have finally won. Farmers began protesting soon after India's parliament passed three agriculture laws they say favour big corporations and leaves them worse off. While some rallies ended in violent confrontations with police, Several rounds of talks between farmers' unions and the government failed to end the standoff. Until this sudden announcement by Prime Minister Narendra Modi withdrawing the three controversial laws. In the parliament session starting later this month, we will complete the constitutional process to repeal these three agricultural laws. Farmers are celebrating this victory but see the announcement as the first step. Farmers set up these temporary structures last year when they decided to camp out until the government rolled back the three laws. They say they'll only pack up and go home once the parliament officially revokes them. They also point to critical issues the Prime Minister failed to mention, the 700 farmers who died during the protests and their demand the government guarantees them a minimum price for their crops. Modi's U-turn comes as several states are heading into critical elections early next year. He read the writing on the wall. He realized, unlike many of the people who are around him, that BJP would not have a very easy passage in Uttar Pradesh, which is a very crucial state. And the return of his party to power in 2024 depends largely on how they do in UP. And he wanted to retain UP at all costs. And uh, Western UP is important. So is Punjab for that matter. Modi's announcement comes on the day of one of the biggest festivals for the Sikh community, which has been on the forefront of the farmers' protest. And while that made it more significant, demonstrators say they will continue their sit-in. They've promised to hold pre-planned rallies and will observe the first anniversary of their protest later this month. Pavni Mittal, Al Jazeera, New Delhi. Let's bring in our guests. They're all joining us from New Delhi. Yogendra Yadav, founder of J. Kisan Andolan, an All India Farmers and Farm Workers Organization of Sawaj. He's also a member of the Coordination Committee of Samyukt Kisan Morcha, the coalition leading India's farmers' movement. Ashish Shokla, an international journalist covering India's current affairs and its governing party extensively. Javed M. Ansari, political analyst and commentator. Welcome to the program. Yogendra, who would have thought that Modi would finally back down on a farm reform? He was always insisting it was instrumental to modernize India's agriculture. What do you think has happened? Well, democracy has prevailed. Uh, democracy is all about signals being sent to political rulers. And in this case, signals were about, as your uh, Reporter noted signals were about the upcoming elections in the Uttar Pradesh, which is the largest state in the country. Signals were about the growing unpopularity of the prime minister. Signals were about the government being seen as anti-farmer. Now, in a country where farming accounts for about 60% of the population directly or indirectly, no prime minister wishes to be seen to be so unpopular. 
Although I must say, the striking thing is not that the Prime Minister finally spent coffee. The striking thing is how long it took the government to spell coffee. It is a year now. And just for your viewers, you know, just the, the national capital region of the country surrounded by hundreds of thousands of farmers out there on the street in India's winter, summer, mm -hmm. monsoon, with a determined sense. And the government was not speaking to the farmers for the last 10 months. So I guess democracy has finally prevailed. Ashish, do you think this is pure political calculation by Modi or a realization that there is absolutely no way he can sell this legislation to the farmers anytime soon, at least? I think Mr. Yadav <clears throat> makes me laugh, really, when he says that uh, he is a very unpopular leader because, by all estimate, he remained a very popular leader after what he has achieved during the COVID-19 pandemic. And as far as he says, thousands of farmers, I don't think there have been more farmers than from Punjab, Haryana, and Uttar Pradesh, partly from Uttar Pradesh, which is a very small segment of over 10 crore farmers in this country, which he rightly says is almost 60% of uh, India's workforce. Mm -hmm. So uh, if democracy has prevailed or anarchy has prevailed, I have my own views on it, but we would come to it as the program goes. Javid, do you think that this... Uh, 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 we'll get back to you later, Yogendra, if you don't mind. I'm going to Javid. Just about this move, do you think that it will be enough to win the hearts and minds of the people that the BJP has been describing as terrorists and separatists for almost a year? It's going to be very difficult. And... Uh, you know, I disagree with the panelists who spoke before me in trying to undermine this farmer's means movement. You can, you can wish away, you can, uh, you know, play with numbers. The, the fact is that Mr. Modi has read the writing on the wall. He's capitulated. This is not an act of generosity or magnanimity. This is neither an example of a responsive government. He realized that there would be a huge political price to pay in the forthcoming assembly elections. And that is primarily the reason that he has backed down. Take, and this takes nothing away mm -hmm. from the fact that the farmers have been out there. 700 lives have been lost. If this was only supported by a small group of farmers or, or financed, or if, as the government would have had us believe today before yesterday, this mm -hmm. was a secessionist movement, then 700 lives would not have been lost. Hundreds of thousands of farmers would would not have been out there on the streets braving India's scorching summer and bitter cold. So I think this is a grave injustice uh, to describe this as only representing a minuscule. This, you know, this Mr. Modi may be popular otherwise, but he was extremely, he had become extremely unpopular in the farming community okay. after ramming through these three controversial laws. Yogendra, let's break down the reforms for, for people to, to understand why farmers have been frustrated with the, uh, with, the, with the reform themselves. Initially, they are about the need to loosen some of the rules about sale, pricing, and the storage of the produce. Uh, initially, this should be good for the farmers. Why were they always apprehensive of it? Allow me one word about Mr. Modi's popularity. I was just referring to the fact that India's most credible running political barometer by a magazine called India Today, which is not anti-Modi, has found that in the last six months, his ratings have dropped in a dramatic way. That's what I was referring to. Anyway, to the laws, basically. Uh, well, on the face of it, all these would look very nice. The trouble is that the word reform has been captured, hijacked for things which are actually deforms. Uh, India has a rather patchy system of marketing protection for the farmers. Mm -hmm. What this act did was, it, and, and farmers have been demanding over the years that this patchy protection should be extended. What this law meant to do was instead of expanding this protection available to farmers, it sought to do away with the existing protection. That's where farmers were alarmed. You don't sit in cold outside there for one year if you are not truly alarmed about what it would do to your future. Uh, in terms of uh, storage, 
the system was that it would take away the existing limits on holding. And the farmers felt, and the consumers felt, consumers felt that the prices would go through the roof. Farmers felt and knew that once someone has that kind of control over agriculture uh, produce, holding, mm -hmm. then they can bring the prices down whenever they want it. These are standard practices in market. So these were deforms. These were not reforms. Okay. Ashish, the government said that it won't abandon the minimum support price and that initially it would continue to bring the, uh, the, the incentives and the subsidies. But it failed in a way or another to explain to the people that this is not by any standards an attempt to let them on their own dealing with big corporations in India. See, if you talk about the private, uh, the corporates which will take over uh, the farms as it has been projected, the farmers are at liberty to say no. And as far as the fear is that the APMC, the mandis in which they sell as of now, would be taken away again. There is a no, it's a part of it. It's just that the farmers have had this opportunity now under the farm laws that they could sell it where they could get the maximum price as well as in case the other crops need to be brought in, which mm -hmm. is very necessary because some cereals, some oil seeds, some pulses, they cost a great deal in importing. Mm -hmm. But for that to happen, you need to have a supply system of uh, value chain of storage, of uh, logistics, of digital technologies. But if you are wanting to um, stick to wheat and uh, paddy, which is the case in this uh, mm -hmm. present uh, agitation, which largely are the farmers of these uh, two crops and belonging to Punjab, mm -hmm. Uttar Pradesh and Haryana. So um, I think we are regressing when we are hurting the land, when we are hurting the water table. And when there is not an agitation in the rest of the country, mm -hmm. and it's only a part of this picketed to this area, and to say that they have been under cold when we all know that there have been enough plush arrangements for them um, with tents and everything, to huh? say that they have been shivering, I think it's a, it's, it's a complete uh, um, erroneous uh, uh, kind of narrative. Okay. And it's not so either by the number of the people or the MSP issue, or the fact that Indian... We have, we'll have to move forward to cover different angles of this particular story. Javed, so in this particular case, do you think that the main reason why the Prime Minister decided to back down on the reform, uh, on, the, on the farm reform, is purely political because of the anxiety about losing the state elections, particularly in Punjab and also Uttar Pradesh? I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that that was primarily the reason why this prime minister backed down. Mr. Modi is not known to take a step backward. In fact, he and his supporters have made great virtue out of this. This is only the second time. Even earlier, on the, uh, once earlier, when it came to the land acquisition bill, he backed down. The writing was on the wall. In Western UP, Western UP accounts for 139 seats assembly seats. The BJP had won close to 100, 90 something to be precise. And by all accounts, and you don't have to go by what I say, go by what a ranking member of the BJP, now a governor of MLA, Mr. Satpal Malik said. Mm -hmm. They were in for a severe drubbing. All reports from the ground indicated their cabinet ministers who hailed from that region were unable to go out and campaign in their own villages. So therefore, they read the writing on the wall and they took the step back. Even, re even the recent by-elections, after the recent by-elections, mm -hmm. the BJP got a drubbing and they rolled back the prices of petrol and diesel. So there, there is enough and more evidence to suggest that this was done only because of the elections in mind. Had it been anything else, six, seven hundred lives would not have been lost. They would not have prolonged this. If it had been of the, good, mm -hmm. of the goodness of their heart, they would have realized this. They ought to have never brought these laws in the first place without okay. consulting the very people who were, who were going to be affected so much by it. Yugendra, I mean, the, 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 the reform is shelved for the time being. However, it does not necessarily mean that this is the end for your own problems and the problems for the farmers. Because how can you explain to the international community, for example, and to our viewers, that agriculture which was 600 million, roughly speaking, 
Indians are involved and instrumental to their livelihood, only contributes to something like 16% of India's GDP. In another term, it's about time to think seriously about how to improve this sector. Otherwise, it will just come to a demise one day or another. Absolutely. Uh, how can anyone possibly disagree with this reasoning? But, you know, it reminds me of that uh, old joke. Uh, situation is very serious. Let's do something about it. Here is something, therefore we must do it. No, it doesn't follow. You have to tell me that this something that you have brought on the table is the thing which would solve the problem. So the problem that you describe is absolutely real. Most of Indian farmers are very small farmers. The average uh, farm holding in India is less than one hectare. Uh, productivity is an issue. Marketing is an issue. How to make small farmer into viable farmer is an issue. The only question mm -hmm. we had was, how did these three law help that? How does bringing corporates help that? Now, economists tell me that you have to reduce population dependent on agriculture. Sounds lovely. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, where would you send them? Would you throw them in the sea? There is no uh, employment being generated in urban India. No industrialization is taking place. So the only solution that we have is to make our existing agriculture, small holding agriculture viable. Mm -hmm. And this particular set of changes, which are called reforms, and I insist these were deforms, they actually took you away from this challenge. This doesn't help Indian farmers at all. And, and I think we must move away from a colonial mindset that believes that these uh, farmers are idiots, that believes that they are infants who don't know what is good or bad for them. Mm -hmm. For once, I would request uh, my co-panelist to please consider that these farmers may have a mind of their own. All right. Ashish, you said that uh, Modi remains more popular than ever. But when you look at this latest setback combined with other setbacks, particularly when it comes to what he always described as landmark reforms, which were shelved, which could not be implemented, particularly when it comes to the, uh, to the reforms of the, uh, of the land and the citizenship reform and the other reforms that he promised he will introduce. They didn't work out. Could this be an indication that the prime minister will end up just a lame duck leader for the remainder of his second term? I think <clears throat> let's uh, admit and let's uh, uh, kind of not disagree on this, that this man has been in public eye for a fair, fair part of more than three decades and been quite successful at it. So he can't be a fool. Secondly, after COVID successful negotiation, I don't think anyone could deny him how India has come up Trump so far on COVID thing. As far as reforms are concerned, as you know, the Supreme Court had appointed a three-member committee and one of whom, Anil Ghanpar, which everyone knows now by now, has said that the recommendation which we had given to Supreme Court, which in its own wisdom it has not disclosed so far, mm -hmm. Anil Ghanpar says that I am going to make it public because I think these reforms largely are in interest of India's farmers and to 80% people, 80% farmers they spoke to, they said, except for a little tweaking here and there, these farmers, these reforms are good for the community. Mm -hmm. So when the SC appointed committee, a member of it, and he says that all three of us were on the same page, if they said that these reforms were good for the farmers and what it is being done at the moment is to hijack it for self-interest and maybe um, interest to, make, to create unrest in India okay. uh, by creating criminal divide, I think needs to give a very serious thought to it. Javid, uh, if the farmers manage with the very notion of nationwide strikes to bring about this reversal by Prime Minister, do you think that this could bring the or galvanise the opposition to build momentum in the near future in India? In an ideal world, that's what ought to happen. But I've, in, given the nature of India's opposition, which is so highly fractured, it's, it's a tall task. Mm -hmm. But yes, this could provide some kind of encouragement, provided they are able to sicken their differences and their vaulting egos if they are able to come together. You see, the fact is that this, they are so disparate and you need to have a strong leader and an ideology or an agreed platform or principles on which 
we will come together. At that moment, it is missing. Uh, I just want to answer the, like, the question that you asked my colleague, mm -hmm. Mr. Shukla. I don't think he'll become lame duck, but certainly this, it has punctured a big hole in that myth which he and his cheerleaders had created that he is Mr. No Wrong. Mm -hmm. we've, we've seen that, as in the case of demonetization, now in the case of land acquisition and, and, and what he did yesterday, he, he makes his mistakes. And if you can if pile enough public pressure on him, then even this prime minister can back off. Yep. What I do fear, and a lot of people do believe, that maybe he's going to, in the next coming days, or perhaps even weeks, he might do something really bold and something out of the box to try and recapture that image of a strong, assertive leader. Assertive leader. Okay. For, but for that, we'll have to wait and see. Yogendra, you said it's about time to stop that condescending attitude, colonial attitude toward the, towards the farmers. But, you know, this is a new world with different set of challenges, cyclic uh, drought, floods, climate change, and you cannot just rely on the generous subsidies and the debt waivers from the government to be able to move forward as a farmer because farming was supposed to be the pride of India. It's not the case. You cannot even compete with neighboring countries. So what do you think should be the, the, uh, the alternative or the option for, for your country to move forward when it comes to modernizing the agriculture sector? Uh, allow me to remove one misconception. Mm -hmm. The idea that Indian farmers are receiving some fat subsidies is completely mistaken. A famous sub a study by Professor Ashok Gulati, who Mr. Shukla would agree is actually on the side of the government. That study has found, it's responsible by OECD, it has found that India has given negative subsidy to its farmers in the last two decades. Negative subsidy, not positive. Mm -hmm. So that's a complete myth and a lie that we are giving too many subsidies to the farmers. Yes, subsidy alone is not a solution. Mm -hmm. All over the world, farmers do get subsidy. If India gets similar kinds of subsidy, we don't want more than that. All we were saying was a certain minimum protection for price. Mm -hmm. But yes, we need reforms. We need better marketing infrastructure. And no corporate in the world would come and set up that marketing infrastructure in places where farmers have very little surplus to sell. The government has to step into that. We need better protection. I'm glad you mentioned climate change because climate change is one of the biggest challenges for Indian agriculture. We need better insurance. The current regime has actually reduced the number of people who were insured or the, whose crops were insured. So we need better protection against, uh, against uh, calamities. We need better credit system. We need mm -hmm. move towards uh, corporate uh, to, towards cooperatives, forming of cooperatives, and we need to move towards organic agriculture. Okay. We need uh, we need climate resistant agriculture. But I'm sorry, these three laws had nothing to do with that. These were about corporate capture of Indian agriculture. Okay, gentlemen, we're running out of time. I really appreciate your insights, Yogendra Yadav. Ashish Shukla and Javedem Ansari, thank you. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story for me, Hashim Albara, and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.